You are listening to episode 151 of My Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, and today I have Mr. Morley Robbins back on the show, this time to talk about his new book, Cure Your Fatigue, How Balancing Three Minerals and One Protein is the Solution That You're Looking For. And I want to kick off this show by reading an excerpt that I actually just read this morning because I'm still getting through his book. It's so dense. I don't want to skim it. I want to take my time and digest the information because there's a lot there. But these paragraphs really jumped out at me. And it's from the chapter Oxidation, the Medical Profession's Ironic Blind Spot. Another important nuance of this dynamic is to understand how the focus on ferritin began in 1972, when a British team of researchers published an article that put the spotlight on this iron storage protein. In the tissues of the body, there is ferritin in the cells and mitoferritin in the mitochondria, which are both found inside the cells. They act as storage lockers for iron. Beyond this, it is important to understand that there are really three forms of ferritin. Heavy chain, which requires ferrooxidase enzyme function to load iron into it. Light chain, that acts independent of the enzyme. And serum ferritin, that is an abridged form of light chain ferritin, is actually empty of iron and is being excreted into the serum as a sign of inflammation. Serum ferritin is not a measure of intracellular ferritin. It is a blood test that is measuring an altered ferritin protein showing up in the extracellular medium of the blood, and that blood is outside of the cell. Yes, this is wildly confusing. I have renamed this iron storage marker Errortin, as it is entirely deceptive and misrepresents true iron status in our body. Intracellular ferritin represents less than 10% of the iron in the body. In some research studies, I've seen it as low as 1%, as opposed to the 70% of body iron that hemoglobin represents. Doctors are routinely measuring an intracellular protein, ferritin, in an extracellular medium, blood. This is akin to measuring hay in a barn versus hay in the field. If you want to know how many bales of hay you have in the barn, You do not go outside into the field to start counting it. That simply does not make any sense. And neither does measuring ferritin outside of the cell when it belongs and is metabolically designed to be inside the cells. So just that little piece of the book, there's bomb after bomb. Every page has a truth bomb of that magnitude or greater. And when I start talking about iron overload with people and progressive lipofuscinosis, which is born from iron overload. I often get kind of the fluoride stare or the blank stare and the quote, but my doctor told me I'm anemic, but I've always had low iron, but I have all the signs of iron deficiency anemia. And it's really hard to break through that mental barrier that people have and they like to cling to that ferritin marker that Morley Robbins just demolished in that quote that I shared absolutely obliterated that insane idea of measuring ferritin to assess someone's iron status so I'm going to let Morley break it down I think this is the ninth time I've had him on And each time I learn so much, I take so many notes. This one was so dense with information that I decided to skip the Q&A at the end. So it's truly jam-packed with information and Morley's latest research. And he shares some really interesting thoughts on raw versus pasteurized milk at the end. So here is Morley Robbins. Hey, Mr. Morley Robbins, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be an awesome one. 
and I'm I'm at I'm at lowly sea level, and you're 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 more than a mile high. I love it. Absolutely. I'm on my my high horse. <laughs> That's all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring you back down a peg or two. Well, I'll do my best anyway. Um, yeah. So uh, you just released your new book called Cure Your Fatigue, and it's a yep. play on words with copper C U cure. And I'm almost halfway through it, and I'm just impressed with how riddled it is with um, clinical studies. Uh, every page, maybe five to ten clinical references that you have in there, because a lot of people are skeptical when you start talking about how iron anemia is kind mm-hmm. of a misdiagnosis and how copper toxicity is overblown. They say, "Show me the studies," and I mean, this book now I could point them to. <laughs> it's riddled with them. Yeah, and that's what's missing. And I appreciate what you just said because I've that was my whole focus when I went on social media. Was I mean, it seemed like people were taking pride in how little they could say. So I decided, well, let's reverse that and let's see how much I can say and, and document it with citations. But what's missing in the book is it, there, there needs to be a, um, a bibliography. It doesn't have that. So I've got a bibliography online, but it's it's not in the book. It was going to become a, a real cause celeb, and I just wasn't willing to do that. So maybe in edition number two or three, it'll finally show up. And the other thing that's missing is you probably noticed, no pictures. I need pictures. <laughs> you know, in a visual society, they're going to go, what? No pictures? But they'll get over it. Yeah, we need a kid's version. Like uh, for yeah. homeschoolers. <laughs> <laughs> no, the kids. The kids' version is for the doctors. <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta really simplify it so they really understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I just finished the the chapter three, and it was really good. I have to reread this one multiple times. Uh, how your body makes energy. There's more to this story than doctors know. Yeah. And you talk about the Krebs cycle, glycolysis, and the electron transport chain, and how copper, iron, and magnesium play a role in that system, right? Yeah, and it's it, a couple of people have said, "Wow, this this should be required reading before anyone chases uh, mitochondria at all." So it's I've become a real student of the mitochondria. I mean, and I think we share that passion. Mm-hmm. It's just it's like I, I was first introduced to it by um, Jerry Tennant, who's a, a he's a ophthalmologist. Uh, interestingly enough, in Dallas, and his book is called "Healing Is Voltage." You may have, you may be familiar with it, or certainly your your readers might know of it. And he got really sick. He was he's the guy that perfected laser surgery, laser eye surgery. But as a result of it, there were these toxins that were coming up from the patients that he was operating on, and he got really sick for about seven years. And he, he finally said, "If I can, I've got, I've got to get." My cell's working. He said, if I can get one cell to fire, I can get them all to fire. Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding as you get deeper and deeper into the into the research is that the, the image the image we have of the mitochondria is a cartoon. It was basically Walt Disney's version of how the body works. And when you really get into it, it's way more complicated than just the electron transport chain. And people don't realize all of the different, um, what, what are they called, SLC A25 transporters. There are like 30 of them. And, you know, all of the nuances of things like the uncoupling proteins and the adenine nucleotide trans, transferase or whatever it's called. It's uh, People don't, I didn't know this. Maybe Maybe you knew it, but I was like, Man, you get into it deeper and deeper, and you're like, it's like it just keeps becoming more and more exciting and more and more dynamic. And it's like, but but at the end of the day, it's basically a battery. If the battery doesn't have its charge, it doesn't work. And and what gives the battery its charge is copper. And it's like, good lord, why don't we know this? And 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 what's fascinating is I'm reading this amazing book by. Um, Sam Apple, 
It's called the title is Ravenous. If it, you would love it. It's all about uh, Otto Warburg and his quest to conquer cancer. And it, there's a great there's a great line in there when he's a, a young researcher. Of course, he has a certain hubris about him. He when he when he was finally nominated for the or when he finally won the award, the Nobel Prize. You know what he said? But it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> the, the year that he got nominated in 1931, he was nominated 36 times. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way he was not going to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but um, but the, the thing is, um, it, it's just, it's so subtle. And, and what, what um, Warburg was, was obsessed with was, you know, respiration. He really wanted to understand how does oxygen get dealt with by fish and plants and animals. And he, he once asked a, a very uh, noted scientist when he was a young man, um, well, should I study photosynthesis or should I study cancer? <laughs> the scientist said, uh, Otto, maybe you should focus on cancer photosynthesis seems to be working just fine <laughs> but 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 the thing is he really nailed it. he he's the guy who figured out how the electrons he he's the guy who figured out how many photons are needed to move from photosynthesis photosystem 2 to photosystem 1 and the only way you, you can know about that is if you understand copper but cuz that's the bridge between the the two photosystems and then then he 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 gets the Nobel, and, and what I think is really funny, the the, uh, the, the formal name of, of the enzyme that he's um, attributed to, he's celebrated for, it's called cytochrome C oxidase, complex four. That's the, and, and in the formal nomenclature for it, it's the enzyme classification system. It's EC1.9.3.1. And what year did he win the Nobel Prize? 1931. Wow. So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, but but his his um he's a clever guy, right? You know, he's a pretty smart guy. So so what did he call that enzyme that's run by copper? He called it iron oxidase. Wow! <laughs> just, just to throw everybody off off the scent, and and he he it was originally called Atmung's ferment, which means respiratory ferment. That's German for respiratory ferment. And about the same time that he came up with that name, his arch rival David Kylan, who was over at Cambridge, who's the guy who discovered all of the cytochromes. He's the guy that figured out the cytochromes run on the energy of copper, ding, ding, ding. Oh. And he called, he renamed it from Atmung's ferment to cytochrome C oxidase. And, and uh, Warburg never forgave him. It, it, it formed the basis of a lifelong feud. And so you have the, at, the at the head of the, the scientific pecking order are two guys having a, a kindergarten brawl over what to name it, but not tell people how it really works. And and that's when I began to learn all those kind of the backstory, I was like, why don't we try to pull the curtain back and let people know how the body really works? And when you really get into it as as you're learning from the, the book, and I'm just I'm just thrilled that you're still asleep having gotten halfway through it. Um, <laughs> But but as you get in the book, you find out how important magnesium is. You find out how important copper is. And you find out how really incredibly destructive iron is, especially to the mitochondria. Because what's important for people to understand is that um, iron and oxygen have a terminal destination in the mitochondria. It's, a, it's, it's such a, a basic a piece of uh, physiology. And, and metabolic fact is like, oh, so then we got to be able to manage this oxygen thing, and we got to be able to manage these iron atoms. And guess what? If the mitochondria is not making energy, you can't recycle iron. 
it, it's 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 so basic. So so what, what I get a, what I get a real charge out of is how all these uh, experts in aging like to tell you how aging comes from Mars, and you know aging is it's just this mysterious condition that we don't understand how it happened. Like you know, well wait a minute. The difference between Matt Blackburn and Morley Robbins is probably about 30 years, maybe, and maybe 30 tons of iron, you know? <laughs> and, 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 I, and I got way more of it than you because I'm 30 years older. And it's like, it's not complicated. And it's like, and they act like it's this very mysterious process of aging. And, and well, gee, there's energy loss, but we don't know why. Huh? Are you serious? <laughs> oh my god so the the whole goal of that book is to is to help people realize that um the cure uh, as you noted is with copper just got to make more energy energy hides a, a ton of sins as you know so that's really the focus of the book that's awesome yeah I, one of my favorite things that you say is that the mitochondria isn't a power plant it's a power grid Mm -hmm. And that little nuance I love and yep. in the health space, uh, PEMF, Tesla technology, Rife technology, you right. know, I've been playing with plasma, like the violet ray and the, the mm -hmm. light that emits from plasma is really cool. But I feel yep. like all that stuff works better or it works at all <laughs> only if you have cop uh, copper in your mitochondria and magnesium because yep. it's that's kind of like a, a jump start, right? But you need yep. right. to be able to hold a charge. <laughs> That's that's just it, and and it's actually it's actually I just learned something recently that's important, and I think you'll appreciate this. The mitochondria do a lot of things, but but there's three things that they absolutely have to do. All mitochondria need to do three things. This this these three actions are what defined mitochondria apart from all the other organelles and cells and things like that. Number one, they've got to be able to respire oxygen. So what does that mean? Respire oxygen. It's kind of an awkward phrase. Well, it means that they, they have a unique ability to turn O2 into 2H2O. Got, mitochondria are water wheels. They need to be able to make water from the oxygen because it's a poison. So they've got to make water. And, what, and why is water important? What's the pH of water? Seven. And when the pH is seven, you have optimal energy production. Really, really important. And once you've got the pH of seven and you're producing water, then you can turn ADP into magnesium ATP. It's got to be done in a pH of seven. Can't, can't do it at 6.3 or 5.8 or you know 9.0. So 7.0 is real important, but it's Respire oxygen means make water. Like, okay, so that's number one. Number two is you got to be able to maintain the mitochondrial um, membrane potential. The, the energy gets stored in the bilipid membrane of the mitochondria and then ultimately the, the bilipid membrane of the cell. But, but that voltage needs to be maintained. And ideally, it needs to be around 120 millivolts. It's amazing that they know that. I find that fascinating. And it's it's the it's actually the, the flow of hydrogens that maintain that potential. Really, really important. And so the, the hydrogen flow is what maintains the the, the um, membrane potential. And if it gets too high, if it starts to get up to like 180. Then you've got all sorts of oxidative stress, and if it gets too low, no go. It just you know they, the, the mitochondria can't function. So that 120 is real important. What's the, what's isn't that kind of similar to our house 120? Isn't that what the current is in the home? Um, <laughs> it's amazing. And then the third thing that the, the mitochondria need to be able to do is make ATP. They got to be able to turn ADP into ATP, and the the mechanism that does that, um, ATP synthase, the complex five, it's spinning at a modest 9,000 revolutions per minute. So we're making 27,000 ATP per minute. 
But what people don't appreciate is that they're, they're stacked on top of each other. So it's like, it's hard to imagine these little, this little power grid, how many, there, there might be thousands of mitochondria in one cell. And there are all, all these little complexes are stacked on top of each other like pancakes. And they're just like <laughs> putting out all this energy. And we're like, most people don't have a clue. They don't even know. They're like, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling tired. Well, there's a reason why you're feeling tired. You've got a lousy diet. You've got too much stress in your life. You're not, you're not mindful of the um, the magnesium burn rate in your in your world. So those three functions, I think, are interrelated, but they're separate and distinct. So they're they're almost like a triad of of what defines the mitochondria. And if those three functions don't work right, then you can't make proteins. You can't recycle iron and you can't regulate calcium and you can't make amino acids. And, and it just goes on and on and on. <clears throat> and all the problems that people have are when the mitochondria, the, the power grid starts to power down. And then all, the, all these obligate functions don't get done. Well, there's a reason why they're not getting done. And it's just, it's so important for people to realize that it's, at some level, it's so basic. It's so incredibly basic. It's just, it's the order of magnitude of the, the, the gazillion, literally the quadrillions of, of mitochondria that we, we go, wow, that's, that's amazing. But it's all over the body. And then just the, the sheer orders of magnitude difference between what's going on inside the brain versus what's going on inside the rest of the body. It's just, it's amazing to, to think about. Yeah, before I found your work, I used to, talk about the magnesium burn rate in like a kindergarten way and say, you know, like everybody, stress depletes magnesium. But I like in your book, you really emphasize that what increases your magnesium burn rate the most is iron induced oxidative stress. And same with copper. So it's like right. getting to the root instead of just blanketing it this, you know, broad term stress. <laughs> you know? That took me seven years to figure that out. That's how slow I am. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was really obsessed with um, stress, obviously, and magnesium. That's how I cut my teeth. But it was, it was, um, it was about seven years ago. I was reading this um, article by an Italian researcher. You know, there, there are a handful of articles that I wish I would give my left arm to find those articles again. I, I've got a photographic memory, but I can't find the articles. But this one article, I think it was by Dr. Pietrangelo, famous Italian uh, iron researcher. And he started the article by the greatest stress to humans is iron stress. And it was like this ton of bricks hit me. I went, oh my God, that's that's where the oxidative stress is coming from. It's, <laughs> light bulb so, yeah definite light bulb yeah 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 and, i just it, oh sorry go ahead no no, no i was just gonna say it's, it's but it's not part of the it's not the cornerstone of of doctor's training regardless of what degree they're going after they're not they're not grounded in the energy dynamics yeah and what what's so cool about your work and the root, root cause protocol and everything that you share is that it's so foundational to everything else that people are doing in the health space. Um, like I keep an eye on the pulse of the biohacking space or human optimization realm and, you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, ozone therapy, people are doing IV and shooting themselves up with, you name it, methylene blue, NAD IVs. Right. Right. Oh, and then yeah. on, the, on the worst end, ascorbic acid and right. you know, vitamin right. D and stuff. Um, but yeah, I just interviewed my friend Charles on ozone therapy and my mind's been blown that, it can't, unlike hyperbaric, it can't cause oxidative stress. Um, according to him, above, uh, it can only do that above a pH of eight. And it actually increases oxygen utilization. But I feel like your work just meshes so well with all of these therapies that people are doing in the health space. And they'd all work better if they're aware of what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a, um, an understandable gap in people's understanding of copper because it's been pushed into the corner of, oh, you're copper toxic. And I had a fascinating chat with a client today who was, um, she's in her 60s and she's worried about memory loss and bone loss and things like that. 
And she's no stranger to the RCP. And um, in fact, she's been doing it for a number of years. What I did not know until today is that she's, she's a small woman to begin with. And then she lost some unwanted weight. And so she's become even smaller. Well, she can't, she can't donate blood. Wow. So the iron is getting mobilized in her body. And um, her, on her hair test, her copper was like four times higher than it should be. So I'm, I'm like the first thing I think is, okay, what's the chemical in her life that's blowing up the ceruloplasm? So we're talking, and about 45 minutes into the, the conversation, because I, I, I'm picking at it, you can imagine, like I'm, I'm like a, a, a sheepdog. I'm, 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 I'm nibbling at the edges of what, what the problem is. And, and she's telling me about the fact that she's um, done a water test. She and her husband live in a uh, home that has well water. So they tested the, the water from the well and then the water inside the house. And they were looking, for, what were they looking for? They were spooked by George Brewer, who's like, oh, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease because of your copper pipes. And what they <laughs> discovered was there was absolutely no, there was a minimal amount of copper in the well water. And even through the ki copper pipes in their home, it, it was the um, parts per million in the water in the house was 0.14. And the, and the reference range is anything below 1.0 is considered excellent. And so it's just like it, it blows out this, this whole thing about, oh, you're going to get Alzheimer's if, you've got, if you're drinking from water from a copper pipe. Now, that's an N of 1. I, I get that. But, but what's, what's fascinating is it wasn't until 45 minutes into the conversation and she said, you know, maybe this might be a factor. She'd gotten a UTI. Like, now, wow. you got to keep in mind, we're talking about someone in their 60s who's in, in Georgia and having to deal with the insanity that we've all been dealing with for the last two years, right? And that, that's a right. point of stress, point of stress. And some, something, I don't, I don't know that she really knows what tripped her wire, but she got stressed out. She got a UTI. And this is someone who's been using Uva Ursi and Manitol for years to keep her infections at bay, which 90% of, of UTIs are from E. coli, and she was on top of it, but she still got the infection. She goes to the doctor. What did the doctor do? He gave her an antibiotic. Bactrim. Boom. Blew up her ceruloplasm. Now we understand why the copper is elevated. And, and then about three months later, he, he told, the doctor said, if you feel better in about three days, you can stop the Bactrim. So she did, because she felt better. I've never heard a doctor say that ever. It's always take the full 10-day course, right? I always hear that. He said, yeah, go ahead. Three days, you'll be fine. So she did that. And then in three months, it was back. So she had to do a second round. And, and I'm like, oh, my God. And so, so the long story short is she's now got the name of a mobile phlebotomist who can come to her home because we did it online. I, did, I, was, I was Googling it for her, and um, this person's going to come and do a blood donation so she can start to get rid of what? The excess iron that's causing what? The infection. And, and what's, what's missing in the, in the urinary tract and the bladder, the, the tissue is called urothelium. And urothelium needs to be able to release copper and ceruloplasm to kill the pathogen, the E. coli. And there's a third function. It detoxes the iron out of the tissue. Wow. <laughs> so that the uh, uh, E. coli doesn't have a medium to live on. And it's just the one th one thing that I would would advise your listeners, and they probably know this, but I'm just going to reinforce it. This is this is not arrogance. This is just natural fact. The protocol does work. It mobilizes iron, 
And when you mobilize iron, you've got to be able to get rid of it. You've got to be able to offload it. And I think what, what's come to light, Matt, is that we have, especially those of us two-legged rats that live in North America, we have an unnatural amount of iron in our body. And what, what I think the protocol is doing is it's mobilizing this unnatural level of iron, especially in someone my age. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm 69 years old now, right? I, I'm, I should be in a, in a stroller, right? But, but the thing is, it's, there's a lot of iron in our body. Maybe, maybe more in mine because I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And you, you were born, what, in the 80s, right? Late 80s? 87. Yeah, I consumed a lot of uh, cereal, though. Uh, like my entire ch- tons of breads and cereal. <laughs> okay. Well, then, then we were raised on the same, same uh, diet of, of uh, champions. And uh, Pop-Tarts and Snicker mm-hmm. bars and, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, I, uh, Frosted Flakes, <laughs> you know. The hell with Popeye. I don't want the spinach. I want the Frosted Flakes. I want to be like uh, Tony the Tiger, not Popeye. But, um, so the thing is, it's, it's not unusual for people to have a lot of iron. And I, I think what's really hard for everyone to comprehend is you don't look like you have iron on the outside. You're not a strapping looking guy. You've, you're really healthy. You've got a lot of vitality. But, but if we were to pull back the curtain on your tissue, it's like, oh my God, there's, there's probably a, lo- a lot of iron that, that your great great grandparents didn't have. Mm. And we just, we, we're, we're not readily um, aware of that when, when we start to do these detoxes and start to focus on mito life and things like that to really try to revitalize our body. Yeah. You want to hear something funny uh, that I heard the other day, because I've been researching near infrared lights and I guess John Harvey Kellogg was the okay. guy that first used the, the heat lamps on humans. I think he had a certain name for it, but he was seeing how he could affect physiology using heat lamps. This is the same guy that created Kellogg's cereal. <laughs> so it's, I guess he was a eugenicist. I looked into him a little oh, bit. <laughs> that's absolutely true. And what, what I've learned, there's a, um, I think I, I, if I haven't sent this article to you, I will. But it's by Francisco Gonzalez Lima, L-I-M-A, 2015. And he's talking about the importance of red light therapy and methylene blue. How could you not love that article, right? <laughs> and, and it's all about complex four and what makes complex four so special. Complex four, which is where oxygen becomes water, um, it absorbs red light but it emits blue light. Now, if you, I don't, do people, can they see, do, do people see a physical image or they just hear us talking? They just hear us. At some point I might post the video, but for now it's just audio only. Okay. Yeah. But I can post anything in the show. Well, notes I have, mm-hmm. No, I was just, I was just going to have you hold up the book, but it doesn't make sense. Oh. <laughs> but for the folks that don't have, for the folks that don't have the book yet, and, they're, and I should emphasize, they're cheaper by the dozen. Um, <laughs> uh, the cover is purple. Why is the cover purple? Because the, bac- the bacteria that are also called mit- mitochondria are called purple bacteria. And that's why they're purple, because they absorb red light and they emit blue light. Oh. And so, you know, and here's a here's an interesting fact. I'm still trying to figure this out. Maybe you can maybe you can solve this riddle for me. Red light. Red light stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Blue light stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. Now here's where it gets confusing. Red light resonates with copper. Blue light resonates with iron. Huh. And it's, it's the exact opposite of what I would expect. Because I would expect copper to be stimulating the parasympathetic, rest, rest and recovery, 
and I would expect iron to be getting us all jazzed up and ready to run from the, the bear. And, it, and it's just the opposite. So maybe maybe you or one of your listeners can, can help bring some uh, wisdom to that. But it's to me, the physics of light and the mitochondria is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, our, our favorite contrarian, Adam Bergstrom, <laughs> he often says yeah, that yeah. what more sympathetic dominance than parasympathetic? Because I guess parasympathetic can cause a lot of disease and issues. Um, so I wonder if that's in line with what he says. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it, uh, also, you recently said that eating liver, will it has a ton of lipofuscin, so you don't want to eat liver. And I'm like, I don't know if, don't, wouldn't you just digest the lipofuscin? <laughs> I don't know if it if you would. Well, see, I, think, I think what we have to be careful of it. <clears throat> And, and the, you know, I, I think what's going to be fun is when we do one of these face to face and we can and we can do the the, um, the the image of the frog and the, um, the what's the what's the bird, the big bird with the big um, mouth where the where the, yeah. the <laughs> we're going to try to kill each other over, over, over lipofusin. But, it, but again, it's. Um, I don't think you, I think you've got to focus on energy mm. and not the exhaust. And I, and I reckon, I really appreciate what Adam is saying about how destructive it is, but it's how did it get created? That's what we need to focus on. How, where did it come from and what can we do to minimize that? So I, I think that I, I've never read that, that there's a high concentration of lipofusin. certainly makes sense given the, the fatty membranes, but it's like, uh, it sustained civilization for millennia, you know, and, and I think it also begs the question of what's changed in our environment that would make the liver more threatening now. And we could we could spend days talking about that. Yeah, and one of the cool studies you sent me um, that relates to this topic was neurovascular unit dysfunction <laughs> with blood. It's a, it's a mouthful. Blood brain barrier hyperpermeability contributes to major depressive disorder and there's a really cool picture i'll post the study below and you said my favorite word was there in the bottom right it's this big uh yeah. picture with a lot going on here <laughs> it, it's a it's an amazing picture with a lot going on but what it what it does is um and it's we're, we're, we're into the um the brain neurochemistry which is fascinating um mm. but but what's important to really grasp in that picture it's um figure two of that particular mm. article is all those little red dots, reactive oxygen species. And, and those are all the little matches that create the problem. And, and where did those, where did those little matches come from? It's because, you know, mm. once we get inside the, the brain, we're going to be dealing with a lot of iron. I mean, it's, think, think about it. The, the brain is 2% of the body weight, but it consumes 20% of the oxygen. So that's a lot of iron that's got to come dancing through the brain tissue. I think it's important for people to realize that, that the, it's the reactive oxygen species that get created because iron's not being regulated by copper. And so it's, again... Reactive oxygen species, and then they, they're talking about reactive nitrogen species, which is a whole other conversation. But they don't, they don't come from, from the moon. They're coming from inside our tissue because the, the mineral concentration isn't right in our brains and things like that. And I just I thought it was a particularly revealing article that, that helped to kind of break apart why is it? Why do we have all these problems with neurodegeneration? And it and it connected a lot of dots that will help people realize that it's not a lot of moving parts, but there are several that are very very important. And and the, what I thought was particularly important, the, what really jumped out at me, was a BH four. BH four is very very important for um, the nitric oxide cycle and a lot of other things, uh, methylation as well, but it can get oxidized. And if it gets oxidized, it doesn't work right. And so, and what's really important for BH4? 
folate. And, and what very few people know is that folate, B9, it's copper dependent. You don't see that in the literature. So I was, I was talking with one of my, my real heroes, a uh, copper hero is uh, Leslie Clavet. For people who really want to understand copper, look up Dr. Clavet. He's an MD, PhD. And, and he can say more in, in four sentences than most people can say in four pages. But um, he's, he's a real efficient but thoughtful writer about copper and what it does. And I was having a conversation with him years and years ago. And I said, Dr. Clavet, I have this theory that all of the B vitamins require copper but regulate iron. He said, that's an intriguing theory, Morley. He said, I can't speak for all the B vitamins. He said, but what I can tell you for a fact, is that B9 folate is copper dependent. Well, when you see, when I learn something like that from this, from a preeminent scientist like Dr. Clavet, that becomes an anchor point of truth. It becomes a cornerstone that you can then begin to build all these different theories around because where does B9 get involved? Oh, in making, oh, vitamin D, breaking down retinol. Little little functions like that, uh, helping helping developing fetuses. Oh, maybe this giving people folic acid is not the answer. Maybe it should be folate that has the actual mineral copper in it, and it just begins to build on itself. But but when I see like BH four is getting oxidized, I'm thinking, wow, maybe the folate's not working right. Maybe it's not where it needs to be because you can't make BH four without folate, and so it's. So people, a diagram like this is so valuable because it begins to introduce all these new players. But if you don't understand in the backdrop that folate's copper dependent, well, then you don't fully appreciate what the what the diagram is saying. And and that's that's the story of copper on the planet. It's been marginalized. It's been swept under the rug. It's been tucked aside and it's been turned into a toxin. Oh, you're you're copper toxic. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> so yeah. that, that becomes part of the challenge for folks. Yeah, I was laughing reading some of the Amazon reviews. They were just, you know, copper toxicity, this book's BS. You know, <laughs> I was just cracking up. And people get so emotional about this topic. And it's like, we're talking about minerals. Like, really? Like, if you get emotionally wound up, isn't that a sign that you <laughs> have mineral dysregulation? That's right. Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a fair way of, of describing it, and it's just um, what what's amazing in this in this day and age. Here we are, uh, November of 2021. We've just been subjected to uh, 23 months of abuse, and people are still defending the status quo, still saying. Well, what they're teaching me on the internet has got to be true. I'm like, oh my gosh, they, they really believe that. And it's like, when, once, you know, in March of last year, March and April, everyone was really unsettled by what was going on. You know, January and February were kind of less like, ah, it's just, it's a fringe issue. But by March and April, it became a real issue because we had to do that two weeks to flatten the curve, right? <laughs> And so the, the the thing is that the then then by July you're like wait a minute come on and then you realize that that what I did is I, I decided to do the uh, arithmetic of 1984 you know take the publication date subtract it from the title you get 36 add 36 to the title you get 2020 okay I get it this is this is the activation of the of the um, totalitarian state. Okay. And so everything that we've been taught and programmed to think, programmed to think, it's all part of this this whole shift that they're trying to bring in. And it's like, not enough people figured that out. You know, it became an IQ test and a lot of people didn't pass it. Right. Yeah. I'm working on getting Jim Stevenson on um, for one of the next shows here. And Awesome. We were chatting and he's been going back and forth with like the metabolic health community because they're very pro vitamin D, most of them. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he went point by point 
And they've been like debating back and forth with articles. And it's really interesting to watch um, because they're, you know, it's, it's such a intense battle of ideas <laughs> and, you know, it's study after study, you know, oh, you interpreted this study wrong and here's this study. And there's a lot of hyper-focusing on PTH from what I've found. It's like, yep. they say that vitamin D is the main controlling factor for PTH. And if that lowers and PTH goes up and that's bad, therefore vitamin D is good. <laughs> it's like very simplistic. But, but, but PTH keys off of magnesium, <laughs> just like vitamin D keys off of magnesium. And so they use circular arguments to try to defend their position around a, a, a hormone that depends on retinol, the vitamin D receptor, which depends on magnesium, and RXR, which depends on retinol. It's like, oh my God, it's like, whatever. I mean, <laughs> that, that'll be a fun conversation to listen to when, when Jim gets back on, because he has a very unique way of filleting the, uh, the competition, as you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I wanted to um, bring up when you were talking about that woman's story, you used the phrase blew up ceruloplasmin. And um, there's a lot of things that do that. that we've talked about here on the show that you mentioned like high fructose corn syrup, which whenever I go out to eat now, I'm looking at the Heinz ketchup and 99% of the time there'll be high fructose corn syrup in it um, and ascorbic acid. But my question for you, are there, are there like really bad offenders like is there like a top three or a top five of this huge list because tons of supplements that people are taking i mean i think even nac and glutathione i mean the list is yeah. huge right <laughs> it is no it is huge and, and what a coincidence right so i think the, the biggest offenders ascorbic acid hands down i mean it was it was identified in the original 1948 study by holmberg and laurel so that that's far and away. And then people are like, what? You know, ascorbic uh. But again, ascorbic acid and vitamin C are, are as different as bicycles and race cars. But the average person doesn't know that. But ascorbic acid, citric acid, citric acid is everywhere. And it's it's a it's a known endogenous inhibitor of ceruloplasm. That's how it was described in a 1966 article. No. Okay. So that, that's, that's important. <clears throat> uh, probably the, the most effective way to blow it up, antibiotics. Hmm. Absolutely. Boom. And, and what, what's important is there's a key tyrosine amino acid. It's, it's, again, ceruloplasma has 1,066 amino acids, but there's one that's the trap door. And it's like, it's like, it's like tyrosine 272 or something like that. So there's a very specific nomenclature for it. <clears throat> and when it gets oxidized by these agents that we're talking about, the trap door opens up and the, and the coppers come out like diarrhea. You'd think they'd come out kind of, ooh, should I come out now? No, <sighs> just as soon as that trap door opens up and it's, it's like, there's a wow to it. But um, antibiotics, now the ones that are going to make people really uncomfortable, hormone replacement therapy, you know, they, again, it's just, it's just the nature of the, of the beast. Um, any kind of behavioral meds. I read this really powerful article on schizophrenia, and they noted in the study that there was this explosion in copper. So what, what one author tried to do was blame the schizophrenia on the copper. And another author in the, in the article, this was amazing, said, actually, I think maybe it was the medication that blew up the ceruloplasm that caused the copper to leak. And it's like, they're having an argument in the article. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this was an article from like, like, like 2012 or something like that. And it's like, it, it wasn't some ancient um, study, but, but people, it, and if it's that many, uh, is it most? And the, and the real thing, the real issue with high fructose corn syrup is that it blocks copper absorption. It, it isn't just that it disrupts the, uh, uh, the protein, it's that it, it prevents copper uptake in the digestive tract. Well, that's a problem. You know, if you can't, if you can't absorb it, then you can't make it. 
and so it but but the the challenge is if you don't know about ceruloplasmin then it's very easy to believe copper can be toxic you don't you don't know about it and that's where the the system has created this awareness that is based on it's it's a it's a um, error of omission. They forgot to tell us about ceruloplasmin, and they don't teach doctors about ceruloplasmin. They don't teach doctors about the locus ceruleus, which is the the watchtower keeping track of neuroinflammation, and where and the signal for inflammation is coming from where the gut. And it's traveling up what highway? Oh, yeah, the vagus nerve, which is 90% of the signaling is from the, the gut to the brain. And and what what keeps the locus ceruleus happy? Ceruloplasmin. It's like, and so if you if you can't make it or you keep blowing it up, well then this is a this is a really useful statistic for people to know. When the Lucas, Lucas, when the locus ceruleus, which is Latin for blue dot, there's a great article. Hey, doctor, why is there a blue dot on my MRI? So it's, it's a wonderful article. But um, when the locus ceruleus burns out, when it's not re- restored and refreshed by ceruloplasm, then it loses its watchtower function. When it loses its watchtower function, you lose the ability to, to manufacture noradrenaline which is essential in the body to stop inflammation. That's a big deal, right? And so <clears throat> what, what precedes, what, what I should say it this way, what follows the breakdown of the locus ceruleus? 20 years after the locus ceruleus breaks down, you have behavioral disorders and all forms of neurodegeneration. 20 years later. Now, what is fascinating is when was the locus ceruleus first identified? 1808. Wow. That's a, little, that's a couple of years ago, right? When did, when did scientists really start to delve in and study it closely? Around 2000. So it only took 200 years to figure out why it was important. And it is, I would say, <clears throat> it's part of what I call the blue stream. And so we've got the blue protein, we've got the, the blueprint called AMPK, and we've got the blue pool, the matrix of the mitochondria, and then we've got this blue dot. And the blue dot, it's if, if you were to drill a hole, it's going to be back in the, the back of your brain, and it's about the size of your thumbnail, 50,000 neurons. The neurons are, are the length of your arm, Matt. They're about three feet long. Wow. It's amazing. And and they only have a, a few million mitochondria in them. It's not, it couldn't be important. And so it's like, and, and so there's this, there's this um, grade school understanding of these conditions like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's because doctors have not been trained in copper metabolism. Co- doctors have not been trained in mitochondrial metabolism. Doctors have not been trained in how oxygen needs to be regulated in the body. And it's it's like, wow, you know, it's it's like asking a four-year-old to repair your car. You know, it's like it's just it doesn't make sense. And it's and I'm not faulting the doctors. I really am not. They they've not been trained properly, or at least completely, and and they don't ask because they don't know. And each one of those few, each one of the, you said a few million mitochondria per neuron, each one of those mitochondria has, is it the copper matrix pool? Is 50,000 yeah. atoms of copper in them? Yeah. It's so like yeah. multiply 50,000 times 2 million. <laughs> and so, so what, what's important for me, to, here, here's another statistic for the, for the gearheads out there. So the, the three highest copper concentrations in the brain are the substantia nigra, which leads to Parkinson's, the hippocampus, which leads to Alzheimer's, and the corpus callosum, which leads to multiple sclerosis. Those are the three most significant uh, neurodegenerative conditions that we have. All three are 
copper centers in the brain. Now, now you're sitting down, right? You got your seatbelt on, right? <laughs> Strapping in. Okay, there you go. <laughs> get your, you better get your life machine going. Get your, your Tesla coils going. The locus ceruleus has 10 times more copper than any other brain region. Yeah, it's, it's like the, the order of magnitude is so great, you can't even comprehend it. And then we're supposed to believe in Alzheimer's disease. And we're supposed to leave, believe someone like George Brewer, who tells us it's copper toxicity and it's water running through your copper pipes. And it's like, that's what's driving these blowhards on Amazon. Oh, it's copper toxicity. It's like, it's, it's almost, it's, it's really kind of sad where the mindset of, of humanity is versus the reality and the truth of the situation. You have me thinking about the colors because you think Republicans wear red, Democrats <laughs> wear blue, and the elites wear purple, right? Like, isn't that like right? a That's right. Oh, well, it's fascinating. So, yeah. <laughs> and again, here, here's this. Is, I just learned this this morning. This is amazing. Um, there's a there's a good reason why we shouldn't eat or use synthetic B vitamins because they come from coal tar derivatives, right? Yeah, we we know that. And and what's the problem with coal tar derivatives? Well, there's ten thousand uh, components of coal tar derivatives, five thousand of which have names. Like, wait a minute. Let me scratch my head on that one. They, there's five thousand things that they think are out there, but they don't have names for them yet. But what I learned this morning, uh, there's a very, most people probably know who Otto Warburg is. He's, he's Mr. Mitochondria, right? He, again, he's, he's Mr. EC 1.9.3.1, right? And, um, and in his institute, there were two portraits, one in the center on the wall and the other one off to the side. Well, the one in the center was Louis Pasteur. That gives you a clue about where he was. And then off to the side was a guy named, I shouldn't call him a guy, he's, he was a gifted a physician researcher, Paul Ehrlich, who won the Nobel Prize in 1908 with Ely Meknikoff um, for the work on immunity. But when uh, <clears throat> when Ehrlich was a med student, so he's back in, he gets his medical degree in, in 1888, okay? His, his fellow classmates were always intrigued by the fact that his fingers were yellow, red, blue, and green. He was obsessed with colors. And where did he find these colors? They were all found in coal tar derivatives. So what's the color of coal tar? It, it's the color of your shirt, Matt. It's black. What is the color of black? It's all colors, right? And when something's white, there's no color. But black is all colors. And somehow, Paul Ehrlich figured out how to separate the colors. And, and he was working with these colors. And, and he's the guy, and, and four years after he gets out of med school, he cures two people of malaria with what color? Blue, methylene blue. Wow. He, he cures two people of malaria. And it had been originally discovered at BASF by one of their chemists in 1876. They, they, they're the ones that developed methylene blue. And when mm -hmm. BASF found out that, that uh, Ehrlich had cured people of malaria with methylene blue, they said, Dr. Ehrlich, that's good on you. That's great. We're going to make it better. So what did they do? They turned methylene blue into hydroxychloroquine. And so in 1892, Dr. Ehrlich cured people of malaria with methylene blue. And now in the modern era, if someone gets malaria, they get treated. Notice the difference in the word. You can cure with methylene blue. You can treat with hydroxychloroquine. And they take hydroxychloroquine for the rest of their life. Cha-ching, cha-ching, 
So we have a cash flow. And that's what the whole thing's about. And, and that's why the title of the book is Cure Your Fatigue, because it's all based on kappa. <laughs> And 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 then there's then there's people bitching and moaning on Amazon about copper toxicity. It's like it's like it just doesn't end, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought up methylene blue because I think we had a, a conversation on the phone about it like a month ago or so. Yeah. And it's been blowing up in like the health space. Methyl- yeah. And I actually got censored on uh, social media. They censored me pretty hard, restricted me multiple times. I think because I kept talking about methylene blue and they were treating me like I was a drug dealer you know, selling illicit substances or whatever. <laughs> it's getting so we've, crazy. We've, we've all eaten with silverware. We know what silverware is. And we know that silverware gets tarnished, right? It turns it turns the, the color of your mustache. It gets kind of brown, right? Kind of the reddish brown. It's like it needs to be polished. Well, guess what methylene blue is? It's copper polish. It's It's buffing up the copper enzymes throughout our body. It is not complicated. It's like you know, people think, oh, it must have copper in it. it. You know, it does. It actually has 50 parts per million copper, which is, it would be 50 pounds of copper in a million pounds of water. That's what 50 parts per million means. But, um, but it's got a bunch of other metals in it too. But the thing is, it's, it, it's, what is methylene blue? It's an electron recycler. What's it doing? It's doing the work of copper. The only way to, again, and I think the world of, of Mark Sloan's book about it, you know, the, whatever, The Guide to Methylene Blue, mm. The Ultimate Guide to Methylene Blue, it's a great book. I learned a ton from it. But, mm. but the thing is, what, what, we, what we're thinking within the RCP community is that may become the, um, the front end of the, the protocol to do a month of methylene blue just to stabilize the metabolism and then get into the RCP to introduce the nutrients that are needed to make the mitochondria breathe, respire oxygen, you know, keep the keep the membrane potential happy and and make some ATP. That's just that's cool. So I think it's I think it's a fascinating substance, but it but it's grossly misunderstood because people don't understand that every enzyme that methylene blue improves is a copper enzyme. Hundred percent of them. Wow. It's well, it, makes, it makes total sense because all the biohackers say, combine it with red light therapy or combine it with going out in right. full spectrum sunlight. And whenever yep. we have light involved, especially red light, it's going to involve copper. <laughs> and so that makes total sense. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm actually having a whole it show really on that blue next month. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the thing is that people know what inflammation is. Well, they've heard the term. Oh, I've got, I've got me some inflammation. I've got gut inflammation, I've got neuroinflammation, I've got whatever inflammation. Well, inflammation is just a goofy way of saying, I've got piss poor energy production. I'm not making water, I'm making H2O2. I'm not making H2O, I'm making H2O2. And and when you get into the, the real guts of how the complex four works, it's a two stroke engine. And the downstroke creates hydrogen peroxide and the upstroke has got to turn that hydrogen peroxide into two molecules of water 2h2o it means you've got to add some more hydrogens and some more electrons right and if you can't do that because copper ain't there or it ain't it ain't in the right redox state then you're just going to be pumping out hydrogen peroxide and guess what hydrogen peroxide does to complex four bleaches it Wow. So it's supposed to be the color of blue, and it turns white. And what does methylene blue do? It allows it to get back to blue. Wow. I just like, <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> I think it's amazing, but it's like, and it's, again, it really is kindergarten colors. It's a kindergarten function. And... And some people think that's too simple, that it needs to be more complicated. But it's, it's, that's how basic it really is. Yeah, I was just talking to someone the other day about, uh, I think it was the ozone episode, about chlorine dioxin MMS that was mm-hmm. trending for years. Yep. And I wonder why people felt good on that because it's, it's like a for, form of chlorine, right? It's like a 
powerful oxidizer. <laughs> that that is a, that's a substance that I can I have not taken the time to study it, but on the surface it doesn't make sense, but it has amazing properties. I mean, I I can't dispute the recovery that people have. I just wonder what what is it really doing to the mitochondria? I, I just mm -hmm. I don't understand it at, at a level that I that I would like to, but it's it has tremendous street cred, no question about it. It's just it's I don't think it's a natural mechanism, but it works. Mm -hmm. So I I don't want to I don't in any way want to um, criticize it because I don't understand it, and mm -hmm. it, I find it fascinating that it has the impact that it has. Yeah, I notice a lot of people are looking for quick fixes. I guess that's just human nature. And I always try to emphasize through my podcast and re following a reach or whatever that um, you want to get to the root and do the long term solution instead of just trying to do a quick fix, temporary band aid. Absolutely. Um, maybe, maybe sometimes you could do both, but most people aren't interested in that. <laughs> you know? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I always tell people that, that um, you want to side with the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare. And everybody wants to jump into the, into the, uh, the fast track. And I don't think the body, I don't think it's designed to recover quickly. It's designed to recover, but I don't think it's meant to be done in nanoseconds. And, and we've been, I think we've been programmed to think that there are mechanisms or medications or whatever it happens to be that is going to have this instantaneous recovery. And I think that's fool's gold. And at least I think we share that perspective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else, Morley, that you wanted to get into the, the book? I know some listeners sent in questions, um, but uh, you have a pretty cool list at the, bottom, at, the, at the end of starts and stops, which you also have on the RCP website, right? Yeah. So there's, there's an overlap between the obviously the website mm -hmm. and the book. Not everybody wants to go to, to the website. Not everybody wants to go to the book. So we're trying to appeal to different audiences. Um, again, I think it's just getting people to realize that there are stops and starts. I think people, especially in the post-COVID era, are always a little mystified when we're telling people to stop taking ascorbic acid, vitamin D, and zinc. And they've been trained to think that that's their salvation. And again, it's, we're back to what's the source of that information that you're using, that, that, that cocktail, that COVID cocktail. And they'll say, well, it's my naturopath or my, you know, whatever. And I'm like, well, who do you think trained them? Like, like <laughs> who's, who's the puppet master? Like, like, there's, like there's different puppet masters. All the doctors are trained by the same puppet master. And people don't realize that. Right. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate how you go against the grain and it takes a lot of courage to do that because you get so much flack from the, I call it the mainstream alternative when you start mm -hmm. speaking out against zinc, ascorbic acid, vitamin D. Um, and then, I mean, if you want to get really emotional, the, the NAC and the glutathione, that really gets people going. <laughs> well, again, people have been, people have been uh, trained to believe that glutathione is the master antioxidant. It's like, are you kidding? That's like, a, that's like roller skates compared to a Maserati when you compare glutathione to ceruloplasmin. And it's the glutathione's the master greeter in the cell. Who's it greeting? Copper. It loves, it loves to greet copper. And uh, you can't make glutathione without magnesium and copper. And everyone says, oh, yeah, but selenium is really important. Go to, go to Google and look up selenoenzymes copper deficiency. And what, what people are going to find out is like, oh, well, these selenoenzymes don't work without copper. And they don't. The whole, th the whole thing with selenium. And, and what's, the, what's the ratio of copper to selenium in Brazil nuts? It's one for one. So is it the selenium in the Brazil nut or is it the copper in the Brazil nut? Let's talk about that. So, again... People get very defensive, and NAC is, I don't know what to say about that. I, um, again, a simple rule of thumb is if they're selling it, you have to ask yourself, why are they selling it? What, what mineral is missing in my body that I need this supplement? And would I be better off just focusing on that mineral? And the two easiest ones to focus on are magnesium and copper. The one that you should be reducing in your in your body 
despite what your blood test says, is iron. And people need to understand that iron in the blood is very different than iron in the tissue. And that's not me saying that. That's Bruce Ames, who figured that out with his partner, uh, Kalilia back in 2004, that there's 10 times more iron in the tissue than there is in the blood. It's like, that's again, that's another anchor point of truth. That's another cornerstone to say, oh, well, that's an important thing to know. Because Bruce Ames at one point was the most quoted scientist on planet Earth. During, during much of the heyday of his career, he was the, he was the man when it came to science. So it, again, if if you don't know that, then you don't know that that what they're telling you on the internet. Maybe it's not the full story. Mm. So. Yeah, yeah. My beef with NAC is the cysteine part. That's inflammatory if it's not balanced with organ meats and gelatin, and collagen, exactly. those others. And it's funny that it's used to build antioxidants. It's like there's no talk of no one that's taking NAC probably knows about ceruloplasmin, which is not a master mm. antioxidant, right? Right. And so, the, and again, when cysteine gets oxidized, it becomes a problem, right? That's when, it, that's when it's most, most problematic. And so when, when you get into the, the mechanics of reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, and reactive sulfur species, and they're called RONS, R-O-N-S, what what trips the wire? It's always iron. And so it's irons. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, 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 and what's the, you know, everyone's all worried about nitric oxide. You know? there's, there's four different forms of it. They'll tell you there's three, right? So they'll tell you about the endothelial and the neuronal, and those are constitutional. That's a big word, right? means that they depend on calcium. Then there's something called inducible. And what is inducible? It's reacting to iron. It's got a little I in front of it. That's, that's a clue, folks. When it has a little I, INOS is. And, and what's the far and away the biggest producer of nitric oxide in the body? INOS, coming out of macrophages. And then we, then we find out, oh, wow, there's a form of NOS called mitochondrial nitric oxide synthase. And it's constitutional. And it changes the chemistry of the mitochondria because of the nitric oxide. And for the and for the gearheads out there, when does nitric oxide rise in a mitochondria? When copper is becoming less and less bioavailable. And so think about it. The air that we breathe. 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen. That's good to know. And, and, who's, and who's managing the, the balance between those two? It's copper. And so if you don't have enough copper in the mitochondria, you're going to have trouble with the, the, the balance of oxygen and nitric oxide. And what does nitric oxide do? It kills copper enzymes. It, and so people are popping nitric oxide supplements, like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make my, my uh, blood vessels nice and, and flexed. It's like, no, that's not quite what's going to happen. So it's just, yes. it's wild. It's wild. The, the, the narrative versus Mother Nature. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's even nitric oxide boosters, like blood flow for like the pump. I think it's like citrulline, arginine, stuff right. like that. And I like that Ray Pete says CO2 works better and it's safer than nitric oxide. <laughs> totally agree. Again, what is CO2? It's a byproduct of energy production, right? It's like, why don't, why don't we focus on the energy and stop worrying about all these supplements? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, and they can help, but I think they're overused and they're used before the foundation is even put into place, um, yeah. which can cause issues. <laughs> Yeah, but the, the thing is, everybody wants to know what's new. Right. What's new? What's new? What's new? Oh, what's new? Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> Let's go back to basics. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I remember I was at the, I think it was the last Bulletproof conference I ever attended. Um, and 
this doctor was there pushing oxaloacetate tablets and I was hook, line and sinker caught up in it. And I was like, yeah, you know, this is amazing. And I, I was looking into buying it in bulk and keeping it in the freezer and it's super unstable. <laughs> and then, then I learned like we can make it, you know, we don't have to take it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's, there's, there's an enormous incentive to, to develop new concepts and new supplements. But I think what, what people would benefit from is knowing that there's some basic uh, nutrients that we need in our diet. And then we don't need to be as worried about uh, all of these other uh, supplements that they're trying to sell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw a lactoferrin at the supplement store the other day on clearance. It was uh, $25 discounted. I was like, wow, for one bottle. <laughs> and, and where can we find it naturally? Milk, right? Dairy. Yeah. Unprocessed Dairy. milk. What, um, my wife, uh, Dr. Liz and I are reading a book by Ron Schmidt, the, the uh, naturopath, The Untold Story of Milk. If you haven't read that, great book. It's, I think it's one of the best written books I've ever read. And what he was talking about last night, it, I, didn't, I didn't know this, and forgive me if, for my ignorance, but again, lactoferrin, it's a protein. That's, its job is to grab iron in our tissue. Lacto, it's dairy, right? Lactoferrin, it's a protein. And it's, and it's gobbling up the iron in the milk. That's its job. And so, so what they did at the turn of the century was uh, destroy the um, unprocessed milk industry, turned it into pasteurized milk industry, right? And in the process of pasteurizing milk, <clears throat> killed 50 enzymes, one of which was lactoferrin. Another one was called ceruloplasmin and a whole bunch of others. And our ancestors used to get their enzymes from the milk that they ate. But what I did not know, and I'm just, I was like flabbergasted last night. Did you know that they were fortifying milk with iron? No, I just know algae oil and D3. I didn't, I had never seen iron. That's interesting. Iron fortification of milk. Wow. There, there is a wow. wow. So then, wow. so then it begs the question, everyone is, is dairy free and gluten free, right? So they're adding iron to dairy. And of course, everyone keys in on the, on the protein, right? But they're not, they're overlooking the iron. And then on the, the grains, is it the gluten or is it the glyphosate and the iron filings they add to the flour? Are people reacting to, what are, what are people really reacting to? And I was absolutely, I mean, I'm, I'm looking article after article after article about iron fortification of milk. I had no idea. I was, I was just flabbergasted. That's wild. Yeah, coming from Idaho, where you can get raw milk in any grocery store pretty much, almost anywhere. To Colorado, where it's illegal, it's insane. And I know there are a lot of websites now where you can just ship it to your door from Amish farms, right? Um, like there's one in Pennsylvania, but they've been getting hammered by the FDA. So it's it's really sad, and it's really in our face when we see how hard they're cracking down on raw yeah. milk producers. Right. Absolutely. No, it's just it, if if you if you have a, a chance to read the book, what he goes into is in wonderful detail what the erosion of sanity was around unprocessed milk versus pasteurizing the milk. And it's incredible the forces that came. It's like we're witnessing it again today. That this this mysterious force that's saying you must get the you know what. And it back then it was you must stop drinking unprocessed milk and you must drink pasteurized milk. And whenever these mysterious forces arise, people should be running for the hills. And, and it's, I don't think it's happening with the, the speed that it should happen. Would you say that book's better than, uh, was it, um, The Milk of Humankind is Not Pasteurized? That but by uh, William Campbell Douglas. Mm -hmm. Great, great book. William Campbell mm -hmm. Douglas is a very colorful writer mm -hmm. and has a lot of good facts. I think that Ron Schmidt, tells a better story with an equal command of the literature and the science. It's, it's just a, 
I think that William Campbell Douglas is more of a um, he's more of a storyteller, mm-hmm. and and Schmidt comes across as more of a an academic. Says, "You really mm-hmm. want to know what happened? Let me tell you what happened." And he does it in a very approachable way. It's it's not mm-hmm. when I say academic, I, I don't want to turn the audience off and say, "Oh God, I don't want to read." It's it's a beautifully written book, but yeah. but there's a discipline to how he wrote it so that there's no question about what actually happened. That's awesome. Well, I, I'm going to grab some post-its and uh, start making notes because so many pages in your book jumped out at me that I wanted to talk about in the interview and I just well, didn't get to it. <laughs> so so we can do another do that, one. Let's do that yeah. in, our, in our next conversation because I, I would mm-hmm. love to find out what, what's causing heartburn, what's causing surprise, what's causing excitement. <laughs> and, you know, you know, I feel pretty good about the research that's in there. Mm-hmm. But, but you and I have talked enough to know that I don't have mastery of, of the information. And that's why I love these conversations, because, you know, it, it, it does take a village to really understand what's going on in the, in the research. And I look forward to learning where's the disconnect or what, aside from the, the chest beating that's going on Amazon, you know, <laughs> trying to freak people out about copper. But it's like, let's get into the, the guts of it and see What's where's the gnashing of the teeth that, that needs to be corrected? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think people just need to be more open to a, a conversation. I mean, it's if you truly believe what you believe, you shouldn't feel offended if someone challenges it, right? Absolutely not. No, I, not, I again, if you've ever been on a sailboat, you you gotta you gotta sail into the wind if you want to make progress, and so. Mm-hmm. Again, a friend of mine that I worked with years ago said, God, the world would be really boring if we agreed on everything. <laughs> so it's like, no, we've got, we've got to have some disconnects and dis- disharmony to find out, you know, wh- what's, what's the missing piece of the puzzle that, that you discover when you have that kind of uh, conversation. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks, Morley. We'll, uh, I think we'll wrap it up and we'll have to plan another one for the new year. Once I, I get through the book, it's taken me a little longer than I thought. <laughs> it's really dense. There's a lot there. So is it, is it a good dense? It's a good dense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, I want to take my time digesting it. And so it's, it's one of those things where I'm just like, yeah, I read a little bit and then I stop instead of trying to just power through it yeah, and not absorbing all of it. <laughs> And, and then what, yeah. what you got to do is it, it's going to make a great Christmas present for people. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to know how to make energy, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, the cupro protein. I forget where I read that, but you were saying ceruloplasm is a cupro protein and there's tons of those, right? Oh, yeah. Those. Hundreds. Hundreds. Um, what, what people don't realize, there, there's, a, there's a copper pump, uh, ATP7A and ATP7B. And uh, you gotta be able, you gotta load copper into the enzyme in the endoplasmic reticulum. And what if you're talking to uh, Joseph Prohaska, who is a famous copper researcher, he's now retired up at the University of uh, Minnesota. He'll tell you there are eleven copper enzymes, eleven cupro enzymes. Like seriously? So that one ATP seven A. It has a connection to 549 other proteins and enzymes. So it's just that one feeds 549. So there are probably thousands of copper enzymes. We just we just don't know that. And then again, you think about where does oxygen and iron go in the body? Well, you better have copper there if you're going to manage them. So it's it's all over the place. It's amazing. A guy that built a lot of our stuff up in Idaho, he always wears a copper bracelet. And I see people drinking, you know, always ask me, can I drink out of a copper water vessel? And hopefully I'm correct in telling them, you just better make sure you're having retinol coming in. Because most people aren't. They're not eating liver or they're dairy free, right? And that's probably where these external kind of unnatural sources of copper can cause issues, right? (laughs) Well, the way I describe it is you don't, you don't want to wear copper. You want to eat copper. You want to get inside your body. And, Mm. you know, you wearing copper bracelets, that's fine. There's some legitimacy to it, but Mm. you're not going to lick that. No, you're you're better off eating the right kind of foods to 
to uh, you know the vitamin C's and the beef liver and the the mm -hmm. retinol that you're talking about. That's what people need to understand is it, it isn't a really complicated formula. It's a very it's pretty straightforward. They just they just need to have discipline about doing it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Morley. Well, well, thanks so much, and uh, stick around as we close out the show. It's always fun. You bet. Thanks so much, Matt. that's it for today's show. I hope you took notes as always. I really loved what he said about methylene blue and how it's basically copper polish and how it buffs up copper enzymes throughout the body. That's really fascinating to me. I'm actually interviewing a methylene blue expert next month and I plan to ask him about that methylene blue and copper connection. Morley actually convinced me to purchase the book, The Ultimate Guide to Methylene Blue by Mark Sloan. And the subtitle is Remarkable Hope for Depression, COVID, AIDS, other viruses, Alzheimer's, autism, cancer, heart disease, cognitive enhancement, pain, and the great transition to metabolic medicine. And it's funny, the first a few sections he actually mentions my friend Kyle Mamunis that I've had on the show when he's talking about the power of carbon dioxide and the potential harms of nitric oxide that inhibits cytochrome C oxidase function and the thing that gets all the accolades, especially in the biohacking community. It's all about increasing nitric oxide, boosting nitric oxide, taking NO precursors. And that's actually the opposite of what we want to do. Uh, one part that stood out to me in this book was how um, nicotine uh, by itself actually um, inhibits testosterone production. But when you combine nicotine with a nitric oxide inhibitor, um, of which methylene blue is one, caffeine is another, then you actually don't get that uh, negative effect on testosterone, which I found was fascinating. So I should probably stop reading multiple books at a time. That's a problem that I have. But I'm about halfway through um, Morley's book, Cure Your Fatigue. You definitely want to have a stack of post-it notes next to you while you read this because... There's so many spots that you're going to want to bookmark and come back to and connect dots. Morley is so good at explaining things in an easy to understand way. And I think it's important to point out that you don't need to understand the big picture or the big puzzle more accurately all at once and how all the pieces fit together. Um, just do your best and connect the dots that you can the most important ones like serum ferritin is a joke to measure for iron status. Um, anemia is usually a misdiagnosis and is actually iron overload. Um, how most people are not copper toxic, they're copper deficient. Just getting those basic concepts down and then building from those um, is the important thing. I don't think you have to memorize each biochemical step you know in the mitochondria i've been studying natural health for 11 years and my perspective is that we're meant to remember what we're supposed to remember unlike in school and i love adam bergstrom's view of public school um, he's not a fan like me and he thinks that you could learn everything for free if you're curious enough and you don't need to go hundred thousand or hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to a system that forces you to memorize things. Uh, most of my schooling, at least I can speak for, was a complete joke until I reached college and I was able to somewhat choose what I wanted to learn, but it was still a memorization game, which I think is uh, ridiculous and not helpful for people. What good is it is taking a human physiology class and learning and memorizing the names 
of each minutia of the human body versus seeing the big picture. And that's really the issue. I mean, we see it with COVID the last couple of years is people are hyper-focusing on certain things. And it's a very myopic, it's a very um, limited view of life and health. And when you get to the perspective of Morley Robbins and the root cause protocol, it's a really wide view. It's called holistic health. It's taking into account all of these factors. How about how we were raised eating iron filings, ferrous iron in our cereal and drinking fortified milk with vitamin D and algae oil and synthetic retinol, retinol palmitate. These are all factors that matter. You don't detox this stuff out with liposomal products. You rebalance it with this understanding. In Morley's book, he alludes to a section that he breaks down why you don't want to supplement hormone D or vitamin D. And I really look forward to that. I'm actually having Jim Stevenson Jr. back on the show. It's going to be the next episode that's released. And we're going to talk about his latest research on secosteroid hormone D, a.k.a. vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol, the supplement that everyone's slamming in absurd doses. I'll post in the show notes all the links where you can check out Morley's work. Uh, if this is your first time hearing him, definitely go back and listen to the previous eight shows that I've done with him on Mito Life Radio. And if you can't find it on iTunes, check YouTube. They're all archived on there. Uh, RCP123.org is his root cause protocol website. That's where you can connect with a RCP practitioner, and they're all trained in the Weston A. Price kind of tradition and mindset. And so if you need help and you need to be guided along the journey, that's a really good option for you. And if you're a DIYer like myself, then just purchase his book and just go wild with the information, uh, applying it to improve your health and your life. And I think like Morley said, we're probably going to have a few more episodes on his book, breaking it down. Uh, definitely as I go through it, I'm going to be noting uh, things that stick out to me and we'll talk about those in future shows. Uh, if you want to support my work, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have all of my recommended products up there. I'm constantly updating it. I actually just put up the Germ Defender because I've been getting a lot of questions on where to purchase that. And that's my favorite product from Hypoallergenic Air. That was actually my first Mito Life Radio podcast episode. It was David Milburn, feels like forever ago, um, on air quality. And this is a really affordable option to keep mold in check. So you pop one of these in each of your bathrooms, uh, even easier if you just have one bathroom, and it runs 24-7, only uses 2 watts, covers 100 square feet, and it actually cleans surfaces, uh, kills viruses, uh, mold, bacteria. It'll actually clean handles and countertops. When I moved from North Idaho to Colorado here to be closer to my lady, I kept sneezing. Uh, I've had severe dust allergies and some pollen allergies. I just remember sneezing a lot of my childhood. And that could have been the shots that I received or that I wasn't eating high quality dairy or raw dairy. Could have been a lot of factors affecting my immune system. But a lot of it was mold. I was raised on a beach home for 20 years around the beach say 20, 25 years. And if your house is on the coast, usually there's going to be mold toxicity and black mold is really serious. Some people say that you have to throw out all of your books, all of your possessions, move out. And that's the best solution if you live in a moldy home. 
because you literally have to demo the home because it's behind the drywall and yada yada. Um, I don't think so. Maybe I'm naive, but that's my current perspective. And uh, check out PJ Harlow that I interviewed um, on the podcast. She's a mold expert. Uh, she's has a website and she's also on Instagram. Um, I think with these hypoallergenic air filters, maybe Charles Crucial 4 ozone generator, the cold quartz, pumping that through your HVAC system when no one's home and the animals are outside and just pumping the house full of that uh, really powerful ozone. And then maybe using something like home biotic, spraying that around or EM1, which is the same thing as home biotic. I think with those things, you could really mitigate a lot and you don't need to go to the extreme of throwing out all of your books and possessions and, and moving. And you can also support the show by purchasing from MitoLife at mitolife.co. Um, we're working hard on getting stuff back in stock. Poofa Protect should be back in stock pretty soon here in the next few weeks. Uh, Purely K, the probiotic, dissolve it all, panacea, digest it all, and NAD power are all in stock. And really happy to announce that the pure Sheila G resin tablets the panacea product uh, is back in stock that's one of the best-selling products people love taking those with their coffee after their breakfast and that combined with the NED power like two to four capsules I can't recommend doses because I'm not a doctor I personally take six capsules of the NED power um, after breakfast every day and I notice that it's really doing something powerful to my skin. So I've had eczema and acne off and on my entire life, my childhood. And the niacinamide vitamin E combo combined with maybe some UV light therapy or red light therapy is really powerful for the skin. And I'll be talking more about the skin um, since that's a, a fascination of mine and something that I have a lot of experience with uh, in the coming months here. And on the topic of light, I actually just interviewed Andrew Latour of Gemba Red, and that'll be next week's episode. He really blew my mind uh, talking about near-infrared light and really the truth about the red light therapy industry. Uh, I love his no-nonsense approach. He's blunt. He just speaks the truth. He doesn't care about making sales. <laughs> Uh, as I talk about in the show, he actually recommends alternatives if you want to do it cheaper and just risk uh, getting a defective product, which is what you get if you purchase something straight from China versus through a red light therapy company. Uh, but I asked him about near-infrared bulbs. And, and recently, I fell for kind of a gimmick uh, with near-infrared bulbs, kind of like these red light therapy companies that have insane markups. There's a certain company or companies that sell these near infrared bulbs for over a hundred dollars shipped where you can buy them at your local hardware store for $10 a bulb, 10 to $20. If you want to get, you know, one online that is supposedly lower EMF and all these things. And so at gembared.com, Andrew has written a lot of um, scientific articles. Uh, one that was incredible to me was uh, the best near infrared therapy, 250 watt incandescent heat lamps for pain and DIY saunas. And he actually used uh, different uh, meters to measure the different bulbs as far as flicker, the uh, wattage usage and the spectrum. And what he proved again, scientifically, is that they're all pretty much the same. Even the one that the one company is selling for over $100 shipped, uh, it's actually identical to the $10 you know, hardware store, Home Depot, uh, tractor supply store, whatever bulb that you can get. So I was quite surprised and I went ahead and ordered a spectrometer to do my own posts and videos kind of exposing these myths that you have to spend 
tons of money to get a supposedly EMF shielded uh, light versus just getting a Philips or you know Producers Pride or GE or Fight Electric. Those are ones that he um, reviewed. I went ahead and bought the Therabulb, which those are pretty affordable, definitely more affordable than uh, what this one sauna company is selling. So just be aware of marketing. Um, that's why I like having this podcast and uh, this audience is because I could share stuff that I don't see anyone else sharing. They're just sharing products because they're making a killing from affiliate commissions. And if I ever learned that something's overpriced or was not born of integrity and it's kind of a gimmick, then I will absolutely uh, talk about it and do shows and, and videos about it. So that's a really good one. If you're into light therapy, definitely don't miss that one. And I will see you guys next Friday. Happy Thanksgiving and stay supercharged.